Hi there. Our son and daughter, Terry and Linda, are taping this in October 2020, in the middle of the historic COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, my brother Joe wanted me to tell you about us. We haven't always been 80-year-old fogies. I'm Ruth, number two and a half daughter. We had a half-sister who grew up in China, who was finally able to come to Canada in the late 1940s. I was a traveler in the family, the writer of over a dozen books and innumerable newspaper articles. If any of you have a passion for writing, for photography, if so, it's in the family genes. How about a yen for adventure? Well, those genes are in the family too. Your Chinese ancestors were adventurous. They left their tiny village and their families and traveled to a country where they couldn't speak the language. They managed to make a living in Canada. They started out with a laundry, then began a restaurant. I got those adventurous genes too. Do you? Do you have a desire to make the world a better place? If so, I think that's also the result of a gene. Have you ever wondered why you do what you do, feel you have to do sometimes? I've spent much of my life trying to figure out why there's such a thing as racial discrimination and what can be done about it. Yes, we felt discrimination growing up in Brockville, where we, we were the only Asians in our school. People called us many names, nasty names. I still feel a little upset when I hear the word chink. Can you find Alice and me with one of our classes here? On the surface, we were different from everyone else, but we got over the negative feelings those differences made us feel. How do we overcome racial discrimination? Did you know that Chinese people in Canada didn't get Canadian citizenship or the vote until 1947? As I grew older, opportunities opened up for me to do something about racial discrimination. I helped fight it by working with other Asian groups to petition the Canadian government like we did here in the 1950s. We met directly with the Canadian Minister of Immigration. We requested more categories of Asian immigrants to be allowed to come to Canada. Categories like grandparents. And we succeeded. In 1954, I also helped some black friends test a new law that forced restaurant owners in Dresden, Ontario to serve all people regardless of skin color. If you want to learn more about that, look up Dresden, Ontario slash human rights history in Google. You can also see us in a CBC video and a National Film Board film called Journey to Justice. And I once spent five months in Mexico volunteering to help raise living standards in a poverty-stricken indigenous village in a desert. These two efforts helped overcome racial discrimination. Then there was my association with a multi-faith Indian group in Mumbai, India to help transgender prostitutes and beggars in India gain some respect. Hijras were despised then. They were people who had been born male but felt female. The only group that accepted them was a religious sect called Hijras. Most other people hated them. It was genetic discrimination and a group of us tried to help. I like to think we helped change Indian government regulations as a result of ghostwriting a book that about the Hijras. This was long before Canada started giving people a choice of gender identification on official documents. The Hijras sold this booklet on the streets and other people began to understand why they did what they did. The launch of a booklet by Hijras was so unexpected, so inconceivable, that we got a lot of press coverage in the country. I think we even helped to change government regulations. I also spent much of my time writing a dozen versions of a guidebook, helping English-speaking travelers get around China. In doing so, I think I had a part in helping China improve its facilities for tourism. They were pretty bad, even in the 1970s. The guidebook helped many other people see China and understand it firsthand. I even organized some tours to China. And I also collected specimens for Canadian museums. While traveling in China, I was able to save many pieces of fine hand 
made embroideries and handicrafts for museums in Canada, especially for the Bata Shoe Museum in Toronto. I was able to acquire some unique ethnic clothes, like those made of fish skin, real fish skin, salmon, which you can now find in Toronto's Textile Museum of Canada and the University of Alberta in Edmonton. What's my favorite country? That's a hard question. I'm glad I live in Canada and have the opportunity to experience multicultural Toronto. I had a marvelous time work camping in the Canadian Arctic with Inuit people one summer. I'm grateful for Canada's sanity in the midst of a pandemic. I loved Hong Kong as, if it, as it was in the 1980s when we spent four years there. India, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan were among the most fascinating. There was Tibet and China where we camped from one end to the other for over 20 days and saw Mount Kailash and Everest Base Camp. Machu Picchu in Peru was very special. Galapagos for its animals in Chile. Alas, I lost my respect for China because it hasn't been following international rules. I don't want to identify myself as Chinese or even Chinese Canadian. I don't like what the Chinese government has been doing to Uyghur people, for example, people I met in my travels in China. One of my favorite jobs was working for the American Friends Service Committee for almost two years as a volunteer out of an office in Delhi, India. I helped to organize two week long conferences for diplomats and young people in Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, and Cambodia. We were trying to bring leaders, especially of conflicting countries and cultural groups together to try to overcome differences. We brought Russians and Americans together during the Cold War and the Japanese and Hong Kong students together shortly after the Japanese invaders were forced away from Hong Kong. It was an attempt at peacemaking and very satisfying. Did I ever get to see the Lore family village in China? Well, I first went to the New China in 1965. I didn't get to the village where we Lores came from until 1973. Few foreigners were allowed to visit China until then. I took daughter Linda. The village is called Gaon and it's in Taishan County, Guangdong province. In case you're interested in looking it up on a map or going to visit it. It was very poor then, full of mostly tiny one story brick cottages and straw huts. It did have a couple, two or three story buildings. I think it had about 300 people living there then, and now 300 people. Every family in the village was a lorry. It had no private toilets. It, they used communal toilets from which they collected human waste to use as fertilizer in the rice fields. The family graves were very poor. Our grandfather's was one of three foot high earthen mounds covering an urn with his remains. Nothing fancy. They made me understand why grandfather and other relatives left to seek a better life first in Cuba and then in Canada. The family in China was very hospitable to us overseas relatives. They gave me a copy of my family, our family history book, which documented our family history back to the Song Dynasty about 800 years ago. I wrote several articles about it for Canadian newspapers, including one with Linda and me on the cover. What was the most adventurous thing I did? I once flew to Brazil on a one-way ticket hoping to go on to Africa. It was a spiritual exercise as I had no means to go on from there. Finally, I wrote to our mother who sent me money for the return home. I guess I was meant to return to Canada. Africa was to wait until later. As for other adventures, well, I was also shot at while riding a helicopter in Vietnam. I once hitchhiked a ride through the Khyber Pass from Pakistan to Afghanistan. And while we were on safari in Botswana, we got attacked by a bull elephant that had a testosterone problem. What was the best decision I ever made? Well, marrying Mike Malloy. We met in India and married in Hong Kong. Born in Chicago, he was of Latvian and Irish ancestry. I couldn't have asked for a better partner. He was a foreign correspondent for the United Press International and later was an editor for the National Observer, the Asian Wall Street Journal, and Dow Jones Canada. 
Later in India, he was trying to set up a financial news service, also for Dow Jones. He loved exploring the world as much as I did, but he was also a dedicated family man, a loving father, and lots of fun. He had a great sense of humor. I learned a lot from him about the world. He, had, he has an encyclopedic mind. He supported my writing and photography career. He supported our children and took them traveling, too, whenever and wherever he could. His wisest decision was to work and live in Toronto. We celebrated our 55th wedding anniversary at our home there recently. I must admit, I've just written a memoir of over 100 pages during my COVID-19 isolation. If you want to learn more than what I can tell you here, maybe Terry or Linda or Aaron or Robbie will send you a copy. Yes, I believe there'll come a time when we can all go traveling again. Nothing, not even a pandemic, will stop humans from exploring the world and beyond. Very nice, Mother.